Well, great job, music team. Thank you so much for this morning, and what a blessing that was. I hope it's prepared our hearts to worship the Lord here this morning. And uh, great job, Kyle, on that guitar. Wow. Well, it is great to... uh, to come out together on December the 31st. You know, today is like the last day of the year. And uh, I, I'm pretty impressed by that. I'm excited by it because what it gives us is an opportunity to uh, be able to, to take a look back and then to take a look forward, certainly, as well. So it's pretty exciting. It really is. Hopefully you had a Merry Christmas and it was just a great time and and now you're ready for uh, the Happy New Year part of it, right? I mean, it's just kind of like one rolls into the other. Um, it seems like a day yesterday I was here speaking, uh, but that was actually last Sunday night uh, when we had Christmas Eve services. Um, yes, I, I, I went home, and I got home about 7.30, and I thought, well, I'm a little hungry, and Karen and I were planning to leave in the morning, and and so she made me some uh, hot tomato soup, and, and uh, she was cleaning out the, the refrigerator, and she put some other stuff in it. And I started eating it, and I thought to myself, hmm, it doesn't sound right or taste right to me. And I told her, I said, I think this is rancid. Um, <laughs> She said, well, don't eat it if it's rancid. I said, yeah, you're probably right. But, you know, my stomach, uh, you know, can handle it. You know what I'm saying? I can handle it when I'm in China or some other place teaching and I have the prayers of God's people all upon me. God insulates you from that. You know what I mean? But when you're on your own, good luck. So about an hour and a half later, I was violently ill. I've been sick all week long. And yesterday, I finally started to feel human again. Like I say, it just felt like yesterday I was here preaching. (laughs) So happy new year. Are you one of these people that uh, stays up till uh, midnight and watches the proverbial ball drop on TV? Do you do that? Uh, Yeah, good for you. Um, (laughs) Can I just say I went to bed at 8.30, 9 o'clock, and 9.30 all three three nights this past week. Um, And that wasn't because I was sick. But um, yeah, our church used to have New Year's Eve get-togethers, and we had this big potluck dinner, and we'd get together, and the youth would have their th- crazy stuff, and w- but everybody got together, and we watched a black and white film about some ancient historian in the church, like Balthazar Hubmeyer, you know, some of the old Anabaptists and all that. It was very enlightening. It was horrible. It was... <laughs> And he got to the point where no one liked it and everyone mocked it and the pastor would just laugh. And I don't know where he got those films or, or anything like that, but they were hideously boring. Um, I, I remember learning what a Gregarian chant was, thinking to myself, that is horrible. Um, but uh, those were some of my memories. And so since I've been a, a youth pastor and a police officer, I really don't stay up till midnight on, on any night, especially New Year's Eve. So I just figure it this way. Uh, we only have one day left for the Lord to come back in 2017. And I'm praying that this will be the year. You know what I'm saying? I haven't given up hope. Um, But here's the thing. If he happens to come at 1201 of 2018 and I'm sound asleep, the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first because the trump of the Lord will sound, you see. I don't even have to set my alarm. God will wake me up and I'll go right up through the roof and I'll be with the Lord in the air, amen? So I'm looking forward to that. And if that happens tonight, oh, praise God, I can be sleeping when it happens. And that would be fantastic. Happy, happy, happy. Well, today we have the opportunity, as you know, to look at resolutions. And resolutions can be, a, can be a good thing. I mean, they can be very positive. It gives us an opportunity uh, to kind of look at our lives and, and look at areas maybe where God wants to work in our life. I, I think of the resolution where someone wrote, Dear Lord, so far this year I've done well. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. I am very thankful for that. But Lord, in a few minutes, I'm going to be getting out of bed. And from there on out, I'm going to need more help. (laughs) Amen. The Apostle Paul is going to give us uh, some insight, and as we prepare for this message, it really kind of focuses on uh, the new year, and we're going to take a look at Joshua chapter 1, but before we do that, I'm going to ask you to do something with me, if you don't mind, and that is turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 in your Bible, if you would turn there. And I'm going to read a few verses, and I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please, as we have the opportunity uh, to read God's word together. 
The Apostle Paul writes this in verse 10 of Philippians 3. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowships of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which for also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. We rejoice in the reality of your word, and we pray that we would be as Paul, seeking those things which are above, setting our hearts on those things which are above and not on those things which are below. Give us wisdom, Lord, as we approach this topic this morning, and may we grow in our relationship with you in these coming days as you tarry. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I don't want you to miss this, and as we go to uh, the Old Testament in a moment, I want you to be able to look at Philippians chapter 3 and notice Paul's stated goal in verse 10. Paul says that this is what I desire. I desire that I might know him and know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, all three of those things are very, very worthy goals, whereby the Apostle Paul is saying that it is my heart's desire to know Christ in a more deep manner than I currently know him. That is, he wanted to understand uh, our Savior in a deeper way. Uh, Jesus came, he said many things, Uh, there are many things that are written in the Gospels about Jesus, but Paul is seeking to be able to understand in a relational way Jesus Christ more deeply, and so he is desiring this reality in his life, much the same way that Moses in the Old Testament sought to lay hold of the glory of God and see more clearly the glory of God and the working of the glory of God. Paul also states that he's interested in knowing more about the power of the resurrection. You know, God's power is greatly on display with the resurrection. Would you agree? The stone is rolled away. Jesus Christ comes forth from the tomb. He's previously been crucified. There's no question that his body is dead. And here he is raised to new life, and he comes forth from the tomb with great victory. My friends, that is tremendous, miraculous power. Would you agree? And Paul is saying that I want to tap into that. I want to know more about it because when it comes maybe to my prayer life or my opportunities and my my ability to do this for the Lord, I want to be able to tap into the power of God. I want to be a spiritually powerful individual. I want to see answers to prayer. I want to see miracles done. Paul is excited about the power of the resurrection. And then Paul goes on to say, I also want to understand and have a relationship with Christ in such a way that I can fellowship with his sufferings. And when we think of the sufferings of Christ, we ultimately are led to the cross, aren't we? We're led to the cross when we think of the ultimate sacrifice that was made there. And for Paul, Paul is looking at the sacrifice that Christ makes. And he is saying there is fellowship in the sufferings and ultimately to what comes out of those sufferings, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for us, our own personal resurrection. Does that get you excited? Paul says, I want to know more about all these things. This is the quest of my life. In verse 12, he makes it clear. He says, I haven't, I haven't figured it all out yet. I haven't come to that point of of understanding it. He says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. And that word perfect here, you might have a different word in your translation, but the word means mature. It's teleos in the Greek. It means to to come to a point of full maturity as opposed to, to a baby who's immature, who hasn't grown to adulthood yet. The idea is Paul says that I'm still lacking when it comes to my understanding of who Christ is and all of the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I'm dying to know all that. And so this is Paul's desire. This is the quest of his heart. This is the quest of his life. And so he wants to see this maturity take place in his life. And you and I, as we look at our lives spiritually, 
should have a similar quest whereby we desire to know Christ in a more intimate way, understand more significantly the power of the resurrection, and specifically get to understand the fellowship of his suffering. So all of those things are vitally, vitally important. Now take your Bible and go back with me to Joshua chapter 1. For I'd like to use Joshua as an example of someone who is going to be able to see his life pivoting on a very important moment. For us, we are in the same way, December the 31st, pivoting on a very important moment. That is, tomorrow it starts all over again, but it's January 2018. It's changed. It's, it's flipped. And so we have a very unique opportunity to look back over 2017 and look forward to 2018. Are you with me? So here's Joshua. Joshua is going to have the hand of God upon him. It came to pass or came about after the death of Moses uh, to... Um, as a servant of the Lord. And remember, Moses is going to have led the people of Israel out of Egypt. That because of that, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all his people, to the land which I'm giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I've given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses." I don't know about you, but as we go into 2018, it's important to understand what we're bringing into 2018. And what I'm bringing into the new year is partially a product of life having been lived out in a fallen world. You and I live in a fallen world, and there are certain ramifications of that. Now, if you're Joshua, you're thinking to yourself, oh, um, the Lord is telling me that uh, he wants me to do something in particular. Uh, there is a plan that God has for Joshua's life. And I'm not sure Joshua was thinking that this was going to happen. Go back with me to the, just flip the page over to Deuteronomy 34, if you would. Here we have the situation with Moses. You remember Moses was pretty angry with the people of Israel. And he was supposed to get water out of the rock. And God said, speak to the rock. And what did he do? Talk to it lovingly, right? Now, he picked up the staff and he smashes the rock. And God blesses him. There's water that comes out of it. But because of that, there is going to be a penalty. And Moses is not going to go in to the promised land. Pick this up in verse 1 of chapter 34. Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah. It's opposite Jer Jericho. And the Lord shows him all the land. And then verse 4, the Lord says to him, this is the land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I'll give it to your descendants. I've let you see it, Moses, with your eyes, but you're not going to go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him, that is, God buried him in the valley of the land of Moab. No one knows where that is. Uh, this is kind of a tragic situation. Moses is the leader of the people of Israel. And he is a, most of the time, a beloved leader. Uh, there were times when people challenged his leadership. There were people that grumbled and complained, and you know the stories that went on. There were a lot of difficulties but as verse 10 would point out in our text here, there was no question that there was never a prophet like Moses. There was no one who even could compare to him. For the Bible says, since, the t since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. You see, because of the relationship that Moses has with God, there cannot be anyone who is compared to that. And he did all these signs and wonders the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh. So there's quite a track record here with Moses. In fact, I would submit to you that Moses was, even though at times um, beleaguered uh, and complained about, uh, without him, they would be in a world of hurt. Would you agree with that? And so this is a time of trauma for the people of Israel because the Bible says in verse 7, although Moses was 120 when he died, his eye was not dim nor his vigor 
abated. 120 years old is getting old. Now, I just read an article yesterday that if you're 60 years old, there are certain things you can do, and the 60 is becoming the new 30. I read it. It was all about exercise and eating right and doing this and doing that. I, 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 you know, I, I bookmarked that because I want to go back this afternoon and, and start to, you know, if I got to go to the store and, and buy something, I'll, I'll have to do it, you know. I mean, because this is important. I just turned 60 and I want to feel 30. I, I haven't felt 30. Can I just say I haven't felt 30 since I was 30? I mean, it's amazing. But even when I was 40, I didn't feel like I was 30. But now somehow, I, I, you know, being 60, I'm going to feel 30. So I, I'm all over that. Listen, most Moses is 120 years old, and the Bible says that, that he hasn't lost a step. Well, I would say it this way. He is still going full crank. Uh, there's none of his vigor even abated. He, he is in good health. He is strong. He is getting the job done. He is everything God wants him to be, and all of a sudden, God takes him. God takes him up to the mountain, and he's dead. God decides, I'm going to bury you here. Buries him in the valley. No one even knows it. No one knows where he's buried. Nobody can go build a shrine. There's none of that. God says, I'm going to take him. Now, that's a very traumatic event, isn't it? And I would submit to you that the reason why it's such a traumatic event is because of sin and it's because of death. Moses dies because of sin. But before sin entered the world, man didn't have any difficulties, did he? You and I deal with the ramifications of living in a fallen world. The reason why God is tapping Joshua on the shoulder and saying, Joshua, I have a really important job for you to do, and you're going to be the leader of the people of Israel, was because Moses had died. If Moses was still living, if Moses was still in good health, Joshua could continue on his merry way being a supporter and an encourager for Moses, which is, by the way, his no doubt preferred occupation. You see, it's not a role that you would aspire to if you were Joshua. You wouldn't aspire to lead the people of Israel. He's seen already too many things. You remember the spies went into the land? You remember a couple spies said it's doable? He was one, wasn't he? You see, the problem is he knew the hearts of the Israelites. He knew it was a terrible job to have. This isn't one of those deals where he got promoted in his mind. And he is thinking to himself, when God tells him, you're going to lead the people of Israel across the river, he's thinking to himself, oh, my stars, across the river? I mean, I don't even know how to swim. How am I going to get across the river? How am I going to be able to lead these people? He is dealing with this challenge because he is living in a fallen world. Now, you and I are going to step across the threshold when we wake up tomorrow. It'll be 2018. Or if you stay up tonight and watch the ball drop, it'll be 2018. Every one of us has a bag. And it's a product of living in a fallen world. And we are going to take this bag and we're going to step into 2018 with it. Some of us have big bags, some of us have small bags. But here's the thing, there's nothing about this bag that you have control over. Joshua didn't have control over this situation. God taps him on the shoulder and says, this is what you're going to do. This is your bag, you're going to carry it. If there was no sin, there wouldn't have been the wandering, there wouldn't have been any of this but there is sin you and I as we look at 2018 may have something we definitely have something that we're carrying into the new year and it's not of our choosing Think of the people who are homeless in the world today. Think of the people that are homeless in our country. We have all these fires in California. We've had all that mess in Houston with the water from the, the hurricane. We've had, I mean, Puerto Rico still doesn't have its lights on in a lot of places. I mean, it's, it's bad. These, these are people that are suffering in our own country and people suffering around the world, and they have no control over things like the weather. They have no control over their health. 
Many people are afflicted. I talk to people all the time who are dealing with cancer and, and dealing with uh, sometimes resurgent cancer and, 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 and poor diagnosis. And I'm praying for these people on a regular basis. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what did they do? Well, they're living in the, a fallen world, you see. And sin affects all of us, hasn't it? From the air that we breathe and the water that we drink, whatever it may be, you and I have a bag. And I don't know what your bag looks like, and you might not know what my bag looks like, but we all have this bag and we're all taking it across that threshold. Now the second point that we need to remember, not only is it... uh, the ramification of living in a fallen world. But what I'm bringing into the new year uh, is also a product of my choices in 2017 and perhaps before that. Notice with me here as you go back to Deuteronomy 34, notice something that Joshua is going to bring into the new year. Joshua is going to bring in something into, uh, when I say the new year, this new time of his life as a leader of the people of Israel. The Bible simply states this, and I don't think it's um, uh, something we can overstate. Verse 9, Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, and the sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. <clears throat> so Joshua is going to come into the newness of this position that God is calling him to, and he is endowed with the spirit of wisdom. Remember, there are a lot of things that are due to our choice. Joshua was a godly man, and so God blessed him. And part of the blessings that he has is the spirit of wisdom, and he's carrying that forward. Every single one of us is also going to carry a bag across the threshold, and this bag is different than that bag because that bag is the result of living in a fallen world. This bag is a, resor- is a result of my choices. The choices that I've made over the last year, over the last five, after the last 10 years, maybe the last 50 years. And I've got a bag. And I'm carrying it into 2018. Now this bag could be filled with some really good things. It may be that as you live your Christian life this coming year, you're starting out this year and you have a deep relationship with Christ and your faith has been growing. You've been challenged, you've had trial after trial perhaps in your life, but you're recognizing that God is sustaining you and giving you strength. And as you walk over that threshold, you realize that, you know what, God and I together have covered some pretty serious issues and we've come through some rough water. And you are walking in with the assurance that God is near you and you're walking in with a confidence in the Lord. Are you with me? You see, that is one way that you and I can cross into this threshold. Another way that we oftentimes cross into the threshold is by bringing a bag of choices that are sinful choices. And these sinful choices are impacting our world. In fact, we like our sinful choices. We've been carrying this bag around for so long. We just love our sinful choices. We don't want to get rid of our sinful choices. But make no mistake about it, the sinful choices that we make, that we come across the threshold with, will always have an enormous impact on where we are down the road. Because God is not mocked, whatsoever a man sows, he'll also reap. And so as I come across my threshold, I have got good things in my bag and I've got some things that I need to get rid of. I look at life and recognize that there are many choices that we make. And some of the choices that we make It's easy to see the value in. And other choices we just ignore the consequences of. But God is never mocked. We bring across that threshold things that are going to impact us. Another year from now, we'll be going into, if the Lord tarries, 2019. 
Maybe you're not satisfied with where you are as you walk over this threshold in 2018. You really thought that this year was going to be better. Now, there's nothing we can do about this bag. You with me? There's nothing we can do. We're product of living in a fallen world. But there's something we can do about this bag. And what we do with this bag will have lasting impact on our life. Joshua, what are you going to do? As a leader of the people of Israel, what is going to be your plan? Notice Joshua chapter 1, where God taps him on the shoulder and says, I've got a plan, and here it is. God says to him, there in verse 6, be strong and courageous. For you're going to give this people possession of the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse 7, he repeats it over again. He says only be strong and very courageous. Be careful, he says, to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. Verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you'll meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Joshua, if you want to be victorious, it's going to be absolutely essential that you make the right choices in life. And he's telling him here very simply, be strong and courageous. And now we're going to get an answer as to how he can even do that. But he makes it very clear and he says, you're going to have to hold on to, to things that are good. He says, be careful to observe the whole of this instruction. Uh, don't don't deviate. Don't go from one side to the other. Stay right on course. And he says, don't let the book of the law leave your mouth. It needs to be something that you're meditating on because this is so important. You see, wrong choices over time will always have some immediate and some down the road consequences. Joshua, you need the presence and the power of God. And the only way Joshua is going to be successful is if he is, in leading the people of Israel, walking very, very closely with the Lord. You and I have some decisions to make. We have some decisions as to what we're going to carry with us. You carry certain good habits, no doubt. There are very positive things in your life right now, and hopefully you'll continue to carry them forward. And hopefully you have in front of you the passage in Philippians chapter 3, and you're looking at it and you're saying, that is my goal. And as Paul would say, I haven't matured yet. I'm still on a quest. I still want to know God more. I still want to understand the power of the resurrection. I still want to have that relationship enhancement with God. And you may be here and you may be looking at your life and saying, wow, I've got some things in that bag that I haven't been able to get rid of for years and years and years. And maybe they've become life-dominating sins. Maybe they've become addictions in your life. Maybe they've become things that you just don't seem to gain the victory over. What am I going to do in 2018 that will ensure that going into 2019 will be different than where I am today? What I'm seeing today. What am I going to do? Well, you could make a resolution. You could make a resolution. Mark Twain said, New Year's Day. He said, now is the accepted time to make your regular annual good resolution. Next week you can begin paving hell with them as usual. 
Oscar Wilde said, good resolutions are simply checks that men draw on a bank where they don't have an account. (laughs) You see, the problem is you can make all kinds of resolutions and you can go back and you will find that most of the resolutions that are made are, are only good for January. And as a pastor, let me just say, I am a big fan of resolutions. We always see an uptick in attendance in January. We do. Come next week. You'll see for yourself. But these things tend to go by the board. We tend to lock back into the same exact pattern over and over and over again. Like Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. How is it that as you look at 2018 and you, you sit there and you think to yourself, oh, I, I was going to do this, I was going to make a difference here, I was going to change this, and none of that happened because it's so easy to go back and just repeat it over and over and over again. Let me give you some key points to consider. Some key points to consider if you're simply resolving in your mind to pursue Philippians chapter 3, the first thing you need to do is pray to the Lord for wisdom. In James chapter 1 verse 5, it tells us this. It says that we need to pray, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And first thing to do is to pray about resolutions that perhaps God would have you make. And I'm not talking about the the typical, well, I need to do this. I mean, I need to buy a Peloton. I mean, I need to do this. I mean, but pray to the Lord. Where spiritually does God want you to be? Where are some things that need to be dealt with? Second of all, pray for wisdom as how to fulfill those goals, the goals that God gives you. Will you look to the Lord and say, Lord, how, how can I change this? Or what do you want me to do? I mean, being honest with God is essential in this decision-making process. You can't fool God. God sees the motivations of our hearts, doesn't he? He knows exactly what's making us do what we do. He knows that motivation, and he's looking at it carefully. The third thing we need to do is we need to rely on God's strength. We need to rely on God's strength. This is not a situation where you just watched a Nutrisystems commercial And you're going to try to lose weight. That's the number one. Let's just get that over with. 99.9 of us want to lose weight in the next year. Okay, great. All right, good. The problem for the world is the world is seeking to try to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. I'm going to somehow be able to to conquer this. I'm going to change this about my life. I'm going to do this. I'm going to better myself in this particular way. And the world goes about it, but the world goes about it without the help of God. You see, I believe that I can very carefully tell you, I, and I don't know what, you see these weight charts nowadays, it's like I'm supposed to be six foot and 150. It was like everybody told me I was six foot and 150 when I was in high school. They always told me I was a bean pole. So then now that, you know, now I'm filled out and I feel better about it, and they tell me I'm obese. I, mean, I just don't understand those charts, okay? Here's the one thing I do know, and that is all of us, are like Paul when we say we have not obtained where we want to be spiritually, and that is in our relationship with Christ, right? We all want to go there, and I can tell you then that it is the will of God for you to pursue that objective. And if that is your objective now, to know God more deeply and understand him more deeply, then it is going to be important for us to rely on God, rely on his strength. Notice here in Joshua chapter 1 that when God gets through telling Joshua uh, to be strong and courageous, uh, he tells him that there's going to be times uh, when you're going to have challenges. You're going to have challenges. But the key is, he says in verse uh, 12 or verse 9 rather, he says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That was going to be the key for Joshua. Joshua, how are you going to get across that river? Do you know how to swim? Nope. How are you going to defeat all those giants? Do you know weaponry and warfare? Nope. Well, how are you going to take this land? I don't know. 
It was going to be clear that it was going to be up to God being with him in order to be able to produce the victory. And the same thing's true for us. God is going to have to be there with us wherever we go so that we can be strong. Now, there's two admonitions that he tells Joshua that he'll be with him with regard to. One is, he says, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. Do not tremble. Don't be afraid, Joshua. There were going to be moments when Joshua was going to be afraid. How are we going to get across this river? I mean, I mean, that is one of the most amazing miracles in all of Scripture, isn't it? Where, where God just cuts off the waters up above, and they stand on end, and the people of Israel walk across on dry ground. I mean, pretty, pretty amazing, right? If you get a chance, go to the Bible Museum. In the Bible Museum, they have all 12 of those stones. Just the, you know, not these stones, obviously, but the 12 stones that mark the memorial for the people of Israel who crossed uh, through the Jordan River. And each one of the stones has in Hebrew and in English the name of the tribe. It's phenomenal. It's stacked way up to the ceiling. Worth going just to see that. Well, it's exciting when you stop and you think what God is able to do. Joshua, there's times when you're going to be fearful. There are times when you're going to be discouraged. There are times when Joshua was very discouraged. When the men went up to Ai to take the city, and because of the sin in the camp, there were 36 men that died, he was discouraged. In 2018, is it safe to say that there will be times when you and I are fearful? Times when we are discouraged? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the key to victory in 2018, when those things encounter our hearts, will be the presence of Almighty God. Because you know what, Joshua? Wherever you go, I am there. You know, wherever I go, God is going to be there with me. There is something about that. Paul looks at it and he says, I want to know the power of the resurrection. I also want to know the fellowship of your sufferings, Lord, because I'm looking forward to my own resurrection. That's what Paul was saying. Paul is saying, you know what's so cool is that because Jesus is resurrected, I can look forward to being resurrected as well. He says, I want to know more about that. But for him, it was reality, and for us, it's reality as well. You see, there are going to be times when you and I, maybe due to this bag right here, in 2018, are adversely affected by living in a world that's fallen, and we might be terrified. God's got to be close in 2018. Maybe there's times when you get discouraged. There are times when all of us get discouraged. That's the fourth point under being uh, key points to consider. Don't become discouraged with occasional failures. You and I are going to fail at times, aren't we? In our quest to know more about Jesus Christ, there will be times when this rotten bag here, and I'm talking about the bad things that are in this bag, frustrate the daylights out of us, and we want to give it a kick. There's going to be occasional failures. And maybe you are going to go on a diet. You know, you go on a diet, there are going to be failures, aren't there? Uh, some of you are sitting there going, well, I'm going to start mine at midnight tonight. So that in 6 o'clock in the morning, I already got six hours in with nothing. You know what I'm saying? That's good. That's really good. But until then, I'm going to eat like crazy, like right until midnight. That's the way to do it, by the way. You've got to get a little momentum, right? <laughs> you and I will have failures spiritually in, this, in the next year. Uh, there will be times when we know the Spirit of God is telling us to obey or maybe not to sin, and we're going to sin anyway. And we're going to need to go to the Lord in humble fashion and express to the Lord our sorrow over our sin. And be reinstated in our relationship with him. You and I are going to find ourselves at times discouraged, but don't give up. And the last thing, the last point to consider is we need to give God the glory. Psalm chapter 37, verses 5 and 6, it says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. He'll bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noon day. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. And he'll do it. Are you ready for 2018? These changes in our life take time. I think that's part of the problem with all of these resolutions. 
We make resolutions and, uh, well, we're not going to do this. And we, we break the resolution and we just chuck it all and do exactly what we did in 2016 and 2015 and 2014. Staying with it and seeing the benefits is what God is calling us to do. Go back home sometime this week or today even and read through that passage in Philippians chapter 3. May our hearts be challenged to know the Lord more deeply. That we might walk with him in a way that we've not experienced before. Let's pray. As we spend just a moment of time in prayer, let me encourage you this morning. That if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. That is, you're not sure about where you're going to spend your eternity. Maybe you're here today and God is speaking to your heart. It's an important time in your relationship with God. You're here this morning and you would say, Pastor Kevin, God's speaking to my heart. I don't know where I'm going to spend my eternity. How I encourage you this morning not to leave here without finding out the reality of salvation. We have folks at the front who'd be happy to talk with you about knowing for sure where you're going to spend that eternity. Maybe you're here this morning and God's speaking to your heart about, about some areas in your life that, that need to be dealt with. Maybe you understand that many of the ramifications of, of what's in that bag are due to choices. And maybe you would say, I'm not satisfied with some of the choices that I've made. Nonetheless, you're going to carry that into the next year. But what are you going to do about it? Are you, are you satisfied to carry those same sins in the same bag into the next year as well? Or will you do something about it this year? Maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God's speaking to my heart about what's in the bag. I know I have some work to do. The Spirit of God's convicting my heart today. Is there anyone say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me today? God's at work in my heart. Just slip up your hand that I can pray for you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. I know for me, my prayer is as Paul prayed. Lord, I, I want to know you better. But I know that things that are in my bag can keep me from accomplishing that. And so James chapter 1 any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. God, what do you want me to do about this? Would you stand with me, please, as we have a word of prayer? And together we pray. Together we pray for each other and for ourselves. Father, we thank you that you are a merciful God. We thank you, Father, for the joy that you have put in our hearts and lives, Lord. We thank you, Father, for the reality that even though we walk through a world that has fallen and we have various issues that impact us, some painfully, Lord, we recognize that if you are walking this walk with us, Lord, we can be sustained. Father, help us, Lord, to see as Joshua saw that you are all-powerful, that you are able to draw near to us and strengthen us when we need it the most. Help us, Father, when we make choices over these next few weeks and months to make choices with eternity in view. Help us, Father, to, to strike out this year uh, with a desire to know you better and to remove those things that are holding us back from that goal. Work in these hearts, Lord, who've asked for prayer today. Father, I'm pleased to see the Spirit of the Lord working in hearts. And I pray, Father, that you might complete this work in our hearts and lives. May you be glorified in all of these things, for it's in Christ's name I pray it. Amen.